Um, I just want to welcome everyone tonight. Thanks so much for coming along and I'll want to acknowledge the um, Willikali, Willikali people on um, whose land tonight we um, have this wonderful conversation. Um, I, I know there's maybe a couple of people who don't know anything about the podcast. So just to recap, I started November last year interviewing people um, about their life in Broken Hill and um, I wanted to showcase people who um, I think are at the forefront of what the future of Broken Hill would be and also people who I think are interesting and perhaps haven't had a chance to have their voice heard in Broken Hill before and a diverse range of people to really show the breadth of our community. Um, so a bit of a poll, um, hands up if you've listened to um, at least one interview of the podcast. Keep your hand up if you've listened to all 10 interviews. Ah, three. Thank you. My dear friends. <laughs> and I do want to acknowledge, um, I've got a couple of guests in the crowd tonight. Robert Williamson, um, if you put your hand up, Robert, he was the last interview guest. Anne Evers, the basket weaver, is here tonight. Um, and I think that's... Uh, had a few apologies from other people as well. Um, but to begin with, um, I'll ask each of the guests here just to give us a brief recap of what we talked about on the podcast, who you are, um, and yeah, what we talked about. Yeah. Ben, you're going first. He was. <laughs> um, thanks, Gath. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Ben Clavell. Um, I did the first podcast with Kath and my story was that uh, I was a police officer for nearly 22 years in New South Wales and, and worked here in Broken Hill for probably about eight or nine years in total. Um, unfortunately I um, was diagnosed with PTSD in 2019 and um, wasn't able to continue on with my career. Um, and I was retired on medical grounds in 2021. But uh, as we spoke about, um, I moved back to Broken Hill after having done a stint here um, back in the early 2000s and um, I have no intentions and in our family's got no intentions of going anywhere. It's, um, it's an amazing town with some amazing people. And um, one of the people that I met um, along the way was Brendan Cullen, um, which you may or may not know of. Um, who's an amazing bloke who basically, you know, opened himself up to, or he does with anyone um, who's struggling with with issues and so on. But um, yeah, took me under his wing and uh, really helped me out. And I, I credit him for where I am today because, as you can imagine, uh, there's been some fairly dark places um, that some of us have been through, and um, Brendan's been there himself as well. And uh, yeah, he, he talked me into swimming the English Channel with him last year. So <laughs> I went over and um, and did a relay swim with him um, and five other people. And yeah, it was absolutely amazing. So I think that's my general story. Thanks, Ben. It's hard to top, Ben. Oh, gee <laughs> <with that. laughs> uh, My name's Heather. Uh, I'm an occupational therapist by background. And I, I guess, moved here um, with my ex-husband now 14 years ago. Um, we had a bit of a deal that I wanted to go and work in the UK prior to that and he wanted to move back to Broken Hill and, and I said if, if you've moved to the UK with me for a year then I'll come back to Broken Hill with you for a year and we separated five years ago and I'm still here so it tells you so how much about um, how much I like Broken Hill. Um, I guess, um, accidentally fell into um, small business um, seeing the need I started at the hospital as a paediatric OT and then saw that there weren't many private, I guess, opportunities for families to explore um, for the, uh, therapy for their children. So started in an, oh, in the YMCA actually, um, just rented a room and uh, gradually, I guess, built um, a business to include three GPs, um, a psychologist, physio, speeches, um, and we were operating out of a very uh, small residential house on Vulcan Street, much to the um, 
disgruntlement, if that's a word, of our neighbours. <laughs> um, and eventually uh, crossed paths with Steve Radford, who um, had wanted, I guess, Broken Hill to have more in terms of options for healthcare. Uh, we went into partnership three years ago, or more like four years ago, but then three years ago in May, we opened Thrive. Uh, we put in a, an MRI, a CT, X-ray, ultrasound, mammo, uh, consulting rooms for doctors, allied health, a gym, um, care services, what else am I forgetting? Childcare. Child <laughs> um, and I, I guess our vision has been to try and fill the gaps that are numerous in remote health care um, and do that in a really client-centred way. We've still got a long way to go, uh, but that's, I guess, our vision and, and why I'm still here. Well, look at me regretting going last. Um, <laughs> My name's Laurie Emmett and um, I'm basically here because I have prosopagnosia, which is face blindness. So um, the part of my brain that uh, is supposed to identify complex animate objects, i.e. faces, doesn't work. It's not there. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't you're, know how to follow that up. You're, <laughs> <laughs> you're also a beautiful person, Laurie, <laughs> and you've made a... <laughs> You've, um, your perspective on life is amazing and we're going we're gonna to get to that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I feel better now. Um, so um, I'm going to ask each of you a couple of questions. So we'll, I'll start with Laurie. I did find your interview. Um, when I heard your story, I heard about Laurie because I went to the um, women's breakfast, the international breakfast that was held at, uh, palace and I heard your story and I think I spent the whole breakfast going what <laughs> like I just took me so long to comprehend that a condition existed it was so out of the frame of my reference of knowledge so I found it fascinating to learn something I didn't know anything about and um, I was interested in um, I guess a couple of people have commented to me about um, the reference in your the conversation that we had, you often talk about humans and not people, <laughs> um, which a few people found interesting. And I just wondered, is that a conscious choice? No, I didn't actually realise I was doing it. Um, but I, I have sort of found lately I do do I do say humans a lot. I don't know. Um, I suppose. Do you know what? It's probably because I grew up with a lot of dogs and I can recognise them. <laughs> <laughs> and they have their own unique personalities and they were my little people, you know. And so I suppose there is a differentiation there between humans and more general people. I suppose when I'm talking about people, I'm talking about personalities and that can encompass more than just humans. So that's possibly where it comes from, but it's not something that I really realised I was doing. <laughs> Sorry, no. sorry, people. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the week that I released your interview was um, coincidentally the week that the Steel Magnolias show mm. was at Theatre 44 and um, that was just a brilliant stroke of luck, I thought, for me to release it the week um, because Laurie was actually playing Shelby in the theatre and that was your first theatre experience. Yeah. What was that like? Oh, that was fantastic. That was a lot of fun. I really liked it because I don't actually really get stage fright. And I think that's probably because there is a lot of anxiety for me talking one-on-one -on -one with people because I might not know who you are when I'm talking to you. And it's very, I'm, most of my conversation with someone is trying to figure out who the heck they are and what I should and shouldn't say, you know, what they've told me versus what I've told them, you know, like it's, it's, it's quite a minefield. Whereas if I'm up on stage or even here, you know, it's not, I don't have to do that. It's, it's, yeah, it's not about that. So acting is, I don't get the stage fright. Um, I really liked being able to use my southern accent because that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Annoyed the bejesus out of my father for like three weeks beforehand. Um, and yeah, I just, I was very pleased to find that I could learn that many words because <laughs> it was a lot of lines. So I did. Um, remember that. Yeah. 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 I was surprised. <laughs> I did go to the show and um, 
because of our conversation, I was thinking a lot. How did, is she um, recognising her fellow actors on stage by certain things or just by what they're wearing? Because or was that a challenge or the clothing helped you remember who's who? Well, that's actually really easy because it's an enclosed space. So I know who's going to turn up versus who's not. And it's just those people. So, you know, I've, I've got, what was it, a one in five chance of getting it right. And they're all very distinct personalities and very distinct people. So, yeah, um, my only real hassle with a small group like that is making sure that I've got the names down. But that was pretty easy because we were all using each other's names. So, yeah, I do. I know I recognise those people now which is quite lovely. And I'm related to one, so that, like, she's out of the mix anyway. I didn't have to worry about her. That's my cousin, Kathy. Um, uh, Clary, for anyone who saw the play. Um, and then, yeah, I also knew Deb um, already. And then, so that left two others and a boy, which was Armando, because that's the only guy. So that was pretty easy until Richard came on board, but I'd learnt Armando by then. So. Mm. I'm going to go to Heather now. Thanks, thanks, Laurie. Um, Heather, in the interview, you mentioned working as an OT that you really learned to build rapport with people. And I think that's a skill that you've really used um, in, I guess, being able to do a business and start a business and grow a business in Broken Hill. So how do you go about building rapport with people? I think everything comes back to trust and relationships. So if people, um, and I, I give trust until it's broken. So I think I go into things with an open heart and open mind. So I don't think that people are going to um, do wrong by me until they, they do, if that makes sense. So I think that if you're open, then people are open back. Um, and I mean, that hasn't always worked. <laughs> I could tell you a few occasions where it's backfired, but I think what what it does is it gives you, um, it gives people an opportunity to to be real with you, and that's I think um, that a lot of business is is just being honest and being approachable and and actually um, just having, I guess people can often tell when your intentions are good too, and I think in business, especially in healthcare, then um, they they pick up on that. Mm. Um, one of the things that really resonated with me and it was a change in my thinking after listening to your interview and I feel like I've got to know everyone quite well f from the hours I've spent editing people but the thing that changed for me listening to you is I guess I had a mindset a lot that the way that you know we solve uh, perhaps getting um, health resources out here is how do we attract people from away to Broken Hill and I think you really helped me understand how do we encourage local people to be the solution mm -hmm. rather than having um, you know a perspective of getting other people from a way to move here and that really changed me actually mm. um, and so I guess how did that insight happen for you yeah that's there's a lot of funding actually Commonwealth funding at the moment in that space so um, I'd um, it's just part of uh, it's the country university centre is doing this and it's a dream big program. So they're going to all the, the primary schools and they're saying, what do you want to be like? You can pick anything. So I, I think in a town um, and, you know, I guess like I grew up in a farming place and you were either going to be a farmer or a teacher because that's what your family did. Um, you, I think it's, it's hard to see outside of that. So I think there's a lot of merit to be gained in, in just you know exploring those things with children and <laughs> and getting them to think outside of of what they see and, and I think a lot of that's exposure so um, I'm really proud that we take a lot of work experience students and um, you know expose what what all the different options are out there in terms of healthcare because I think it's all about planting those seeds and it might be they might not go and do it from school but they might you know go and do something else and then think oh actually I really like that I might you know, explore that option further. So it's, I guess it's equipping your own community to be able to solve its own problems. And not just kids though, right? Like it's no. also adults perhaps re-educating and um, retraining to fill these positions. Absolutely. And some of the, you know, the best employees we've had are people who, who, you know, go to study later and then, you know, they know what they want to do and they're passionate about it. So, yeah, and it's never too late to, you know, we 
I worked with 67, um, 43, that's another, <laughs> it's a long time in the, in the workforce. So even now to have another career change wouldn't be you know, unheard of. So I think we need to probably um, change how we think about equipping our own community even you know, later. And I think the Country University Centre does a really good job of that because it's so supportive of people studying at whatever stage they're off. Thanks, Heather, and um, I'll go to Ben. Um, ben, um, I'd never, uh, I heard about Ben through a friend and I was really interested because this friend, uh, husband is a police officer and he worked with Ben in Hay and they relocated to Broken Hill because of Ben and I thought, who does that? Who uproots their whole family to follow someone? And I thought, I've got to meet this person, Ben, and understand his story. They had mentioned to me that he, he had PTSD, but I didn't know the extent of your story. Um, your, your interview, Ben, it just was so insightful to police work and it really lifted the lid. Um, I'm wondering, how did that self-awareness and self-reflection come for you? As in the interview that I did with you? Yeah, just the insight that you gave to police work and to, um, I guess, your journey and how you processed what happened to you. Okay, so if I understand what you're asking, is it... Um, how did I figure out that things weren't right? Is that what you're asking? Or Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't, uh, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, is that, um, you know, I, I was just used to running at 100 miles an hour and um, working as hard as I could um, with the view that, um, you know, I, I love my job and I was good at it. Um, so that's what you do. And it was only, you know, a, as time went on that I realised that... Um, Little things just weren't the way that they were. So, you know, as, for, you know, for example, I used to be able to multitask quite well and um, those sort of things went by the wayside. Um, so that I figured that, um, you know, the, the best way to deal with that is just to just concentrate on one thing at a time and do that one thing very well. And then that sort of started breaking down. Um, and then, as I said to you during the, the podcast, you know, other things like, you know, just... <laughs> My wife um, will will say that I've got the worst memory in the world, but I, you know I, I don't know if I'm if it's unique to me. But um, she used to ask me, "How do you actually do your job? Like you know you 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 do your job, and apparently you know you're ticking all the boxes, but you come home and you wouldn't have a clue what the hell's going on." And now I understand that that was my brain's um, you know protective mechanism. It was basically just trying to keep me alive uh, throughout the day. And when I when I'd come home. Um, the only thing I wanted to do was just lay flat on the couch and just literally just um, do nothing because I was I was spent and I guess you know that, that extra effort um, or you know or the ability to be able to be personable um, that left me as well and I just turned into into a zombie um, and it wasn't really until I moved back to Broken Hill um, when uh, my body started telling me that that things were wrong. Um, and I think it's one of those things that, you know, you, you, can, you can have little deals with your brain and you can figure out things and so on. But at some stage or another, um, I felt like it was my subconscious um, and my body telling me that I wasn't listening, I wasn't slowing down. And that uh, if I wasn't going to, and if I was going to keep putting a bandaid over the, the problem, that, um, that my body was going to show me that there were issues. And that's when... I guess, you know, a lot of the physical uh, things started happening and, and I realised from there that, yeah, um, things weren't going well. Mm. Yeah. And it took a lot of courage for you to share your story. I know that you were quite nervous and um, unsure at times. Um, but what motivated to share your story and to be public about y your story? Um, well, to be honest with you, it was probably you. Um, I wouldn't have done it otherwise, except you asked me to do it. So, um, but then I also figured uh, it's one of those life lessons that I teach my kids is that um, you've got to do things that scare you. Um, and I heard once 
um, that if you can do one thing every day that scares you, you you know you're doing you're doing something good. Mm. So um, what you asked me to do was scary, and but I thought no, you know I'll tell my kids certain things, but then I can't be seen to be doing the opposite. So it's time, it's time to tell my story, and um, yeah, you gave me that opportunity. <laughs> Um, now, I understand that you've um, since decided to take up crazy cold swim challenges. So um, tell us about what you've got planned and what you're currently training for. Yeah, so I spoke to you about it in the, in the podcast. It was, it was the first time I'd been swimming with Brennan um, Cullen out at Menindee Lakes. And of course, um, you know, I was dreading it because um, who likes to <laughs> jump into the cold? Um, but it was the first time um, since... Uh, I'd, I'd finish work that my brain literally stopped because I don't know what it is, but you know, um, y- your body's just going into a completely different phase, and the cold um, was was the one thing that made my my brain stop, and it was the one time where I felt like I was just able to just look around and you know um, be part of um, my surroundings, and so. Um, the cold water swimming was part of uh, of Brendan's training for his his English Channel crossing, and then we did the same for ours. Um, now you sort of figure out. I figured out what sort of a swimmer I am. I don't like to do massive distances like you know thirty four kilometres in one go. Um, it doesn't really do it for me. But doing something um, again that that's a little bit scary um, and it's challenging um, is something that I quite like and. I, I really like the cold. And so my day starts at 4 a.m. Um, I wake up every day at 4 a.m. and I might thrive medical at 4.45 a.m. <laughs> Jumping in the ice bath. And so, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so um, I thought I, had, I, I chucked that in there. Um, and then, um, yeah, I'm going off to New Zealand in July uh, to swim uh, in an ice um, swimming competition in um, a little town called Alexandra, which apparently is the coldest town in New Zealand. Wow. Um, <laughs> ben got me in to try the plunge pools at Thrive, <laughs> and he said, you know, I go in there for half an hour at 10 degrees, and I lasted like a minute. <laughs> Tell us about what else you are preparing yourself for. What are you like? You told me that you um, are not letting yourself have warm showers, yep. cold showers. What else? Uh, so yeah, obviously um, we're not going to be able to replicate the uh, the temperature that we need. Um, so an ice swim is classed as uh, anything under five degrees Celsius. So um, at the moment, I can't talk. Uh, Shay into dropping it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could help that. <laughs> but at the moment, the coldest I can get is about nine degrees. Um, so the theory is to try and stay in that nine degrees um, as long as I can. So at the moment, uh, where I would probably be swimming in five degrees for no more than 15, 20 minutes, uh, I'll try and stay in nine degrees for uh, half an hour to 40 minutes. Um, and then I've also um, managed to... Um, get the uh, YMCA and the council to allow me to swim outside during winter, which is awesome. Um, so, yeah, that's basically you're just just a cold fix every day. And, you know, um, anyone who's medical, I've heard that the more that you get into the cold, it creates what they call brown fat, and brown fat is what keeps you um, insulated. And, and um, yeah, um, even though it's um, crap when you first jump in, you just get this calmness over you and it, it sort of goes away it's really good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've increased it to four minutes I've got oh, to wow. four minutes oh, good yeah good yeah good <laughs> um, I'm going to open it up for audience questions now does anyone have a question you'd like to ask any of the guests and I'll um, pass you we'll get a microphone to you if that's all right as well <laughs> you must have a question. It only takes one to ask a question and then the whole thing will open up. You can even ask me a question. Well, thank you, Selena. God bless you. It's not 
intelligent question. <laughs> no, it's, it's... It's about the brown fat. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit more about the brown fat? Because I don't think I've ever heard of that. <laughs> Unless I heard incorrectly. Um, well, <laughs> I'm not medically trained, but I've heard that brown fat's good fat. Um, it's, I think it's, you know, the avocado top fat, whereas... Yeah. So are you um, converting your existing fat into brown fat am or I is it? Heather, or am I just creating it? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is that um, cold water exposure um, is your brown fat is as happens as a result of that. I don't know if it turns the fat that you already have into brown fat or if it's now created um, when you're you know, creating new fat. I don't know. Yeah. And then it stimulates a lot of those metabolic um, processes, I think. So it makes your, your your metabolism go faster. How do you convert? You said you get a calm. Mm. Uh, I've only ever once gone into cold water, and it was just pure panic, and <laughs> yeah, and it didn't last very long. But how do you get to the point of converting the panic to the calm? Um. Well, basically, um, when I jump in, um, like anyone else, it absolutely sucks. And you've just got to get through that pain. And then I think it's because, again, I'm not a medical professional, but your your blood would leave your skin, or not leave completely, but be attracted more to your internal organs to protect your internal organs. Therefore, you're not, you know, you're not feeling, you go sort of numb on your skin. And then after a period of time, then obviously it's you know keeping your internal organs going, um, and you can handle that. It's only after a little you know period of time when the blood starts to circulate back through the body because obviously it has to that you start to get cold. Um, so I think it's just a, a, a numbness because your 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 um, blood leaves your sort of skin area and goes towards your your organs. Is that right? Yeah, it'd be like a like where it's needed most. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just to keep you alive, I guess. Yeah, the, I guess it's the um, you know, the, the nature's way of trying to keep you alive for as long as it can. Um, but then when you get out, that's what they call the after drop. And the after drop is, is it's the worst. So basically then your, your blood that has been trying to keep you alive then starts to circulate. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of it now has gone cold and it now goes back through the rest of your body. And um, I did it, I remember I did a, um, an interview with uh, the BDT after I'd done a... Um, uh, an ice bath and it was the middle of the summer and um, this was before we went over to the English Channel and we had to sit outside in the 40 degree um, sun um, so that I could speak because um, I literally just couldn't speak for about half an hour 40 minutes <laughs> because the cold blood's just pumping back around your body so yeah so that's not ideal yeah. <laughs> doesn't seem to bother whales they must have a lot of brown fat they, they do. <laughs> Another question. Yes. I, I don't, is that going to work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's yeah, the yeah, sound person here? This is very awkward. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, can you cook with brown fat? No, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I was just thinking, it, you know, for those of us who live here in Broken Hill, it's really easy for us to dwell sometimes on the challenges of living out here and what's hard about it and makes our lives difficult. Do you, any of you, each of you think that there's something that Broken Hill has sort of offered you that's made what you want to do here possible or made things possible for you that weren't in other places? And if, if so, what are they? I can start with that one. Yeah, I certainly think I have had far more opportunities here than I would have if I tried this in another area. I think that's due to a number of reasons. So I think the need um, in a place like Broken Hill, I think the willingness of perhaps other people to come out and give it a try. Um, you know, so you've got um, it, the competitors in business have been far less in, I guess, in our area. Um, the receptiveness of, of the community to embrace, um, to embrace people who are trying to give it a go is really unique to Broken Hill, I think. Um, and I think the it's just so easy to live here that that sort of, um, you know, that five minute to, you, <laughs> to get anywhere like you can. Um, 
you can like be at work and then you know go and pick your kids up and then drop them here and then go back to work and, and I know that wouldn't be that simple um, if I was living anywhere else so I think yes for a number of reasons. Yes. I think for me it actually levels out so there's um, for every bad side there's a good side and for every good side there's a bad side so um, uh, as my mum will attest I had the joy of not knowing any of my schoolmates like I'd I'd walk out and, and she'd go, who was that? And I'd go, I don't know. <laughs> She's thinking I'm just being, a, you know, a, a kid and I, I had no clue. Um, but um, I worked with kids for 17 years basically and um, just having this little community of kids um, that – basically grew up with me some of them you know some of them have come up to me and gone oh hey yeah uni was great oh my god <laughs> you know I'm so old you know because they started when they were six you know mm-hmm. and um just being able to to hang out with them and go um you and they didn't care you know they didn't care that I didn't particularly know their names um they just yeah thought thought yeah okay that's her um where I work is a lot of tourists come in so I don't have to know them. Um, and now that I, I know about prospectnosia, if they say they're going to come back, then I can say, oh, hey, I won't recognise you. <laughs> Just let me know what we talked about and we'll be good. Um, and the flip side is that, uh, you know, when I was younger, um, if I wanted to go out, it wasn't as easy as just going out because I wouldn't know who I would or wouldn't know so there's a lot of anxiety a lot of stress so I just didn't I didn't do it so um whereas uh when I've been in Melbourne Adelaide Sydney I've had no problem just wandering down the street by myself or you know going anywhere by myself um or with friends or any of that sort of stuff because I knew I wouldn't know anyone there's no pressure to know anyone I wouldn't have someone come up and go oh hey Laurie how's your mum? Oh God, who are you? Yeah, no, she's good. You know, um, and then say to my mum later, hey, a human said hi. (laughs) (laughs) Can we narrow it down? No, no, we cannot. (laughs) Um, You know, so it's, it's flip sides. And the other, the other sort of good side is that uh, people around me do know most people around me. So I can, sort of go like when I um, worked at my parents furniture store um, NES complete home and someone would come up to pay an account or something I would just wander around to the computer where Colleen was sitting because Colleen knew everyone and goddess that she is would just bring up their details on the screen so I would be able to pretend that I knew who this person was and write out their receipt without having the embarrassment of going who are you like you obviously know me but sorry who are you so yeah, there's there's pros and cons to the small town environment. Um, it, it does allow for a lot, um, but there is a certain uh, sort of pressure t- to know everyone because everyone knows everyone. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, look, I um, what I, I've taken out of Broken Hill um, is just the the amazing experience, oh, the amazing opportunities it's given my family um, and I. So I just find Broken Hill one of those places, one of the last places in the world where you can actually, um, you know, um, have a good, easy, relaxed life. Um, you know, we bought our first house uh, for eighty thousand um, dollars. You know, um, we had our kids out here; they've got great friends. Uh, Yes, we're 12 hours from everywhere, but I quite like that. I reckon uh, the further west I can be of Sydney, the better. Um, so, yeah, the, the fact that it's it's unique, the fact that it's true Australian outback, I love that, absolutely love it. Um, I've had this thing in my mind where, you know, the romance of living in the Australian outback is, is amazing and to be able to live the quality of life that we do um, and... Um, you know, with the opportunities we can give our kids, uh, I think it's, you know, get me on the on the tourism bandwagon. It's one of the best towns around. I love it.
I'll just sneak across here and thank you, everybody. Sorry. No, you're right. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, the sense of calm that you experienced when you first went into um, cold swimming. Now that you've done it so many times, are you able to replicate that sort of composure that you get? Every day. Yeah, so um, I use that, that cold plunge as a, um, as, as a form of meditation. Um, it is literally um, that one time during the day when uh, everything slows down and becomes clear. Um, and, you know, I, I, have, I take the opportunity f- to, to plan my day because I'm sitting in the cold. And it's the only time in my whole day where my brain's not going 100 miles an hour. So, yeah, in answer, in answer to your question, yep, yeah, every day. Steve says, Steve, my business partner, that's why we have ice baths and he's very similar, he's on the go. If it's not here, he's a million other places and that's why we got the ice baths because that's exactly what he says. It's his only time to calm down and not think. So, um, My question is about the inability to recognise faces. How was your journey in realising that that was a thing like how did that happen for you to be able to communicate that to others and go this is what I'm experiencing well yeah it's interesting because um you know as we discussed when you're growing up you don't realize that you're seeing anything different to anyone else um you just get a lot of oh gee you're really bad at this sort of thing um and um, my mother actually saw um a documentary on prosopagnosia on television and there was a lot of you know ha 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 this sounds like you know you're so bad ha 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 and then during I think about the week basically I didn't recognize each of my family members in turn in different places and then it was a bit less haha and more hey (laughs) maybe we should check this out so yeah I went online and sort of read up on everything that I could which is not much and then um, when I'd done that I emailed the people doing the research because it's still very much in the early stages of research um and, um, you know, spoke to them. Um, they were quite interested to hear from me because uh, they're, because it is early days in research, so they're very interested in everybody's sort of views and they sent me quite a number of tests, did the tests. That was very eye-opening. Um, like one of the tests was they show you six faces uh, for a certain amount of time and then they show you six faces and they say, which ones are the same? And I was sat there going wait, what? <laughs> Can I flip back? Some are the same? How? Where? Really? Is this a trick question? Yeah, no, I failed that test. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and they, they there's not a full-on diagnosis available. You know, you can't go to your GP and say, is this a thing? They'll look at you like you're nuts. Um, but they said it's highly likely. Uh, so yeah, that's basically how I came about it. And it was kind of funny, like hearing from my family members just sort of going, what was that when I just didn't know who they were? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Hey, Laurie, I'm just curious um, about, do you, does it apply to voices? Do you recognise people through sound? If I've heard them enough, then yep. yeah, I'm actually really yeah. good. I'm actually really, really good with actors um, because my brain can go, okay, this is a film or a television, so it's going to be this select number of people. This is who I've got to choose from. And then um, because, yeah, they they speak the same all the time, you know, like it's, it's hard to change your voice, it's hard to change your mannerisms, it's very hard to change your laugh. So I can pretty much always pick out actors um and so it does apply in real life as well i do get to know voices i get to know laughs very well um i get to know walks too um whatever i can associate with you is how i'll get to know you but yeah voice i'm pretty good with voices um but part of that too is the words that you use and the way that you talk uh so you know, it might be a similar voice, but somebody's uses more slang than somebody else. Um, and is that how you remember them? 
Is that how you remember them? Yeah, it is part of it. Yeah. So, yeah, voice and then, like I said, everything else. So it's <laughs> anything that's not a face. <laughs> so uh, there are a few people that I know just by their dress sense. Uh, if they ever decide to change their style, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have problems. Um, there's, uh, like, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the interview. I probably did, but there was a kid um, at, who was taking art classes with my workplace with Amanda and she'd always wear cat ears. And one day this other kid turned up wearing cat ears and I mistook her for the other, like, you know, kerfuffle. <laughs> and I just felt like saying, can you not? Like, <laughs> I know you for this stuff. I don't know you for the, yeah. So, yeah, but um, Voices is an o- as a part of the overall... Um, that's one of the reasons that I have extra trouble with names because I don't have anything to attach a name to when I first meet you or even possibly when I second meet you or third. It depends on how much we interact, how much I see of you, how much I see you move, how much I hear of you, um, all of that sort of stuff. And that builds a, a picture for me, it builds a human for me. Um, <laughs> and, and then hopefully somebody will mention your name um, because then I'll have something to attach it to. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how you see the future of Broken Hill and whether you see more people coming here and having those positive experiences you've had. If you have children, whether you see them staying here, say, in the next 20 years and, and how that looks to you. I'll pass that over to the people who've come here. <laughs> Yeah, I um, uh, honestly, I think Broken Hill uh, potentially needs to look at some alternatives for private schooling if we want to retain people here, uh, families here in the long term. When we go to recruit people, they usually, their, their children, um, you know, will get to that year six and then they'll um, look, you know, for what are the options after and, and often they're looking for that private school so I think as a as a community I think that's something that would would really um, help us attract more people to Broken Hill um, I think in terms of um, children coming back here it seems to be a bit of a boomerang it seems to people go away and then they they return um, and they there's something about the place that's that draws people back in and I don't know what it is but it's um I love it that, that it does bring people back and um you know someone like Sheridan for example um who is a um allied health manager um she watched the RFDS series and then you know um <laughs> and then we posted the job ad and she's like oh, I'll give that a crack so I think it, it's <laughs> yes <laughs> Still waiting. Oh, we should arrange that. Anyone look at the RFDS? Um, <laughs> we've got nice baths. Yeah, we got. Yeah, that's right. You can't have everything, Sharon. Um, <laughs> but I think it's got that um, that romanticism about it that that draws people here as well. Um, it's. Just, I think the key is having connections with people so that they go past that. I'm interested in the pl- this place too. I want to stay in this place and call it my home. So, and I think that's all about. Um, community and networks. I think you just about hit the nail on the head. I don't know what else to add, really. I, I mean, obviously, the, the main thing that I would probably say as an outsider is that I'm always concerned about the mines, and I feel um, worried that you know if the mines weren't viable, would the town be viable? Um, and I guess that's just the nature of you know living in a town like we do. But I remember when when I was here in the early 2000s, and um, I think it was uh, um, Pazminko, was it that um, or yeah that that laid off a lot of people. Um, and we we're, we're going through a similar thing at the moment with with CBH and stuff like that. And it's a volatile place to live as far as if you're involved in the mining industry. Um, so that's a concern because. With that, you see changes in population and people leaving and things like that. I could see, um, you know, a long-term future for for my family in this town. Um, but I think, I don't know, just from a a, a person who who loves the place um, and wants to see the best for the place, the constant reliance on on the mines is a concern. This, 
The census data shows us that the main in, uh, industry is tourism, which surprised me. I was like, what, what happened to the mines? But I think if we can continue to look at those, I guess the experience of being in Broken Hill, which I think there's a lot, you know, there's the Monday Monday that's, you know, there's a lot of other things which draw people to Broken Hill, then I think that will go a long way. But Exactly. That helps too. I'll just, I'll just add in, it, 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 it sucks to be here as a teenager. Just, you know, I don't know who else is from here who found that, but it sucks to be here as a teenager. Um, so that would need fixing um, so that people – because, I mean, it's great as a kid because you've got a lot of freedom. You've, you know, your chauffeurs don't have to travel too far to take you to all the things that you want to do. And there's a fair amount of stuff for kids. Like, you know, if anyone was paying attention to the holiday programs, there, there was a lot going on. Although I would like a little bit more for under 12s because my niece is under 12. So. <laughs> but, yeah, when you hit being a teenager, oh, we, we did a lot of meeting in the park to play um, uh, Truth or Dare. Um, and, and I won't go into that because my mother's here. Um, but, um, you know, and, and when I was a teenager, we still had – oh, God, I'm outing my age so bad here – but we had the Plainsman video store with the Daytona down the back and Pizza Hut or you could eat next door. So you would go to a movie if they'd let you in. Um, uh, they didn't always – sometimes the only movie on was, was above your age group. And then you would go to the All You Can Eat Pizza – and mostly eat dessert, and then you would go to um, the Daytona, and that was teenagerdom in Broken Hill, and it was. Eh. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think if you want to connect that kid experience to and the grown up experience, as you say, is really good. You know, um, it is a five minute commute. You pick your, your morning song really carefully because it's the one you're listening to. Um, you know, and it's, the, it's your earworm for the day, so get it right. Um, you can pick up milk on the way home without it being a hassle, even if you've unconsciously driven home and then you go, oh, wait, I need milk. You know, it's it's pretty easy. And house prices, great. Yep. Um, and with tourism, you know, being a big thing and hopefully continuing to be a big thing. Um, it is easy to have a shop that also incorporates a home if, if that's what you need to get started and that sort of stuff. You just need to connect that relatively peaceful grown-up experience with the, the fun childhood experience with something in the middle that isn't unadulterated boredom um, and lack of lack of schooling options because, you you know, you've got the choice of do you go away to uni or do you stay here and what do you do? Get a job kind of in whatever's around as it may be. So, yeah, that would be my only sort of thing. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, just to conclude, I thought we might ask each guest or I'll ask each guest just to reflect on the, this experience and what kind of feedback you had from sharing your interview and what it's led or what's happened as a result of it, any kind of comments. Um, and I thought I'd share, I guess, for me, what um, doing this podcast has um, meant for me or what the feedback has been for me and I've really loved hearing people's feedbacks and just the connections that it's um, that have happened in the community because of it and I um, professionally I guess two big things happened for me as I was um, granted a country um, art support program grant from West Darling Arts and uh, so that's wonderful just uh, use this podcast as kind of evidence or you know experience or an example of my resume and then the other thing that happened um, interestingly for me as I was approached by the Law Society of New South Wales to write a story about access to justice services in Broken Hill for their journal and I'm currently this week been interviewing people and that's currently what I'm working on but um, I had this hunch or thought that um, there was a, a space for um, a local person to write about um, the this town um, but 
but for kind of, um, you know, for the East Coast. So it was really nice to have that opportunity because that's kind of what I wanted or what I thought might be there. So um, that was great. And um, I actually interviewed um, someone here tonight, today, who's um, a lawyer. So And he's come along just to check it out. So that was lovely to have you come along um, tonight. And uh, so that's been my kind of feedback and I'll go to you, Laurie. I found it really interesting to see how a podcast was made. <laughs> what is it? It was good. Um, I suppose for me it's, it's sort of – it's been interesting because this came right on the back of the International Women's Day thing and um, – I'd sort of thought, oh, I'll, I'll talk about this because when I mention it, people haven't heard of it and they are sort of interested. So maybe, you know, maybe that'll be okay. And, yeah, there's been there's been quite a few people interested. So um, I found that interesting in turn, I suppose. Um, I've had feedback of people sort of saying, you know, how do you figure it out in terms of how do they investigate it themselves um and to see if they've got a condition yeah yeah basically just to sort of see yeah you have people who go hey i'm really bad at recognizing people maybe i have that and it's like do you know what you look like because if you don't know what you look like you're a candidate if you know what you look like you might be on the scale (laughs) but yeah that's that's where the big difference is i don't i had to memorize things about what i look like and that's Probably should have been a clue a fair while ago, but anyway. Um, so I suppose that's sort of been my only sort of feedback is there is actually interest in this thing, which I just thought was a bit quirky and made things difficult. <laughs> um, I think for me, it was a good reflective opportunity. So. I think we talked a lot about the, the MRI machine and a lot of the barriers and at the moment, um, you'd, I'm sure you'd experience it in this town, um, but it's very difficult to get a GP appointment and part of that problem is um, a locum workforce so we have a different you know, a different visiting doctor each week and then part of the problem with that is that we can't get registrars because we're not signed up as a, you know, as a training um as a, a company that provides training for registrars so it's this massive big loop and um <laughs> it, it actually it, i reflected on where we started with the mri after we did this podcast and i was like this is you you know we had to jump up and down and and you know um be an advocate for to get those changes so i, I did the same thing actually after our podcast with they're called the recgp so the um rural academy or college or something of general practitioners and I was um, trying to explain to them they need to change their rules to accept more registrar placements um, and then I said or oh, you could come out and have a look and then and they wrote back and they said we'll come Tuesday week and I was like ha okay good <laughs> but, but unless you push those um, unless you're like you know you're, you're almost outspoken and you, and you that's the rule but we don't have to have that rule you know we can change that rule then you're not never going to change anything and I, I, that, I guess the opportunity to think of where we started with MRI and when we ended which you don't really do when you're in it um but you asking the questions I was like oh yeah that that happened and then yeah so it made me apply it to other areas of our business which is good um well first of all I I um the the opportunity gave me was was huge and I want to thank you for that because I wouldn't have done it by myself um but the thing that I think was really important was the message that I was able to get across to some of my mates that are still in the job, and I know that there's there's issues in you know a lot of frontline um, careers and so on, but obviously I can only speak on uh, policing. Um, and the main thing that I learnt was that um, it's normal not to know what's wrong with you, and a lot of cops don't know what's wrong with them. They just all they know is that. Um, you know, they just feel like um, things just keep adding on and adding on and adding on, but they just fight their way through it because that's what everyone else is doing. So I think one of the great things that came out of it for, for myself was to get in contact or people got in contact with me who I'd known for a long time um, who were expressing similar 
feelings and that you know may now sort of understand a little bit about why they feel the way that they do because as i've said to you before the the main thing um and i still can't put my my finger on 100 percent is what is what is wrong with me um you know something's wrong but you don't know what it is and so by verbalizing what we did i think it it helped a lot of other people to be able to say i have similar things going on with me so um maybe it's time that i i have a chat with someone That's really great um, to hear, Ben, that um, people have reached out because of your story in particular. And um, your story did have the most listens, which, um, you know, doesn't surprise me. And it, it's not about, you know, who has the most or not, but I guess um, the issue of um, w how police officers deal with what they're, what, they're see what they see, but also hear and smell and all of the job. Um, that you are so um, well um, able to articulate that. So I think that was so courageous of you to, to share your journey. Um, well, that's it, everyone. So um, thank you so much, Ben, Heather and Laurie, for sharing your stories and um, for listening to the podcast and for coming along tonight. Thank you, Neil. <laughs>